Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Jonathan Edwards. And welcome back to all of you. That's the first time uh, we've been introduced as a panel with dancing, so thank you very much for that. This is uh, my final panel session. It's the final session uh, of this Doha Goals 2014. We're looking at sports leaders as champions in society, uh, both sports stars. There's something, two aspects of this, the sports stars themselves and also the sports institutions. Let me introduce uh, a very distinguished panel to you. Uh, to my left, Ivan Bravo, needs a little introduction, the Director General of the Aspire Academy here in Qatar and at Real Madrid before that. Uh, we've got Len Komorowski, uh, the CEO of the Cleveland Cavaliers, who's delighted to have LeBron James back in the team. Uh, yeah, very popular. <laughs> uh, Mark Pollock, president and founder of the Giving Back Fund in the USA, which leverages uh, celebrity for good causes. And Casey Wasserman, uh, founder and uh, chairman and CEO of the Wasserman Media Group, one of the world's leading sports agencies. Um, now, let me first of all, I'm going to start with you, Mark because if people look at your bio, you're perhaps the least qualified person to be up here in terms of your sporting credentials. Um, but you had a very famous coach, didn't you, when you were at Chicago? Tell us about him. Well, I, more like a tutor. I uh, ran track and played basketball at the University of Chicago, and our uh, track coach happened to be the United States, one of, one of the United States Olympic track coaches, and he introduced me to a gentleman who happened to live nearby on campus uh, named Jesse Owens. <laughs> and I am from Cleveland, proudly, and Jesse Owens happens to be from Cleveland, and so I was fortunate to become friends with Jesse, and uh, he invited me to his apartment and showed me his four gold medals from the uh, 38 Olympics, and then came and tutored me in the long jump. And, I, and I'll tell you something about that. As long as this isn't being taped, and no one's gonna repeat this, <laughs> But I was 18 at the time, he was 65, and I think he was still able to long jump farther than long me. Long jump farther than you. And we're going to talk about sports leaders in society, and was there a greater one than Jesse Owens in many respects, before his time when we were talking about role models? No, he was a true uh, American icon. Um, one of the most principled and decent men of any athlete I've ever known. Um, it, it was an honor to know him, and. He will go down in history as one of the greatest athletes of all time. So these days, we just accept that successful sportsmen and sportswomen are role models. It's not something you opt into. It's just part of the territory. But the initial question I'm going to ask the panel is if this is an acceptable view. Is it right to view sportsmen and sportswomen like that? Is it their responsibility? But what I also want to hear from is some of the students. So once we've heard from the panel members, I want to hear from about five students Okay, so not all from the same institution. Just to how you view sportsmen and women, what you expect from them. Do you expect a different level of morality? Do you expect them to show you how to live? So it'll be very interesting to hear from you because when we talk about role models, it's particularly aimed at young people and we don't want to be patronizing as old people up flankly up here on the stage telling you what we think sportsmen and women would be. Casey, you work with some of the greatest sportsmen and women in the world. What, what's your view on this? Well, I think the, <clears throat> what's really interesting about the issue around athletes being a role model is 15 years ago or 20 years ago, there was the famous Charles Barkley ad by Nike where it was cool to say, I'm not a role model. Uh, and clearly the tide, as you said, has turned uh, and the pendulum has swung, frankly, further the other way than, than sort of a, f a fair center ground. And I think it comes with the territory. One, uh, the athletes are getting the benefit of the platforms um, that they compete on, um, the money associated with that. Uh, most uh, of the ones who you would expect to be role models are choosing to engage in social media in a way that exposes them uh, to the world in a pretty meaningful way. And I think it's naive of an athlete to think that they won't be viewed as a role model. If they don't want to operate in that way, that's um, their entitlement. But um, I, I think athletes should expect to be and ought to be excited to be role models because they can serve a really meaningful role. It's obviously the, the topic of this panel. And I, in this day and age, I'm not sure they really have a choice. Okay. Uh, Mark, I mean, you've, you've made a living now out of persuading celebrities and sportsmen and women to give back, haven't you? What's your view? Well, I think that just as no one is obligated to, to uh, make philanthropic gifts, no one's obligated to be a role model. But I think when you're an athlete, you have an opportunity. When you're famous, Fame in and of itself has no intrinsic value. It'll bring you wealth, but it gives you a platform. And the platform of fame you can take and use for something very important. You can take the spotlight that's on you as an athlete, an athlete 
and turn it on a cause, turn it on something that truly is important. And I think athletes have that opportunity, and it's a tremendous opportunity. I, you know, I, just to, to build off that really well-stated answers uh, from, from both Mark and Casey, uh, I, I can remember we talk about platforms. It wasn't that long ago when ESPN was launched as a network, and the question was, was it going to make it or not? And when you think about the explosion now in the platform itself, it's become stunning. And the appetite for sports and entertainment is only going to continue to grow. And so with that, that, that platform, that spotlight, and also that responsibility, whether you like it or not, is going to be there. Uh, because, in, on, you know, as, as it pertains to that, the prevalence of these athletes, and then ultimately I would translate right, that to organizations, whether it be our franchise or others, and the role that we have to play in our respective communities and the leadership that is expected. Uh, you know, I think ultimately we look at that as a privilege and uh, I think a lot of it speaks to the character of your players as well. And, and I think the good news is what we're seeing is uh, players are recognizing that. They recognize that, you know, they have a special direct relationship with fans. Certainly social media has placed a, uh, a great amount of emphasis on that and we'll only continue to, to expand on that as we go forward. So uh, this, is, this is something I think as far as the dialogue, as Casey talked about, I don't know if there's any, any choice, and the spotlight is only going to continue to get brighter and bigger as we move forward. Uh, I think I would, just, I would just add a little bit to what everybody else is saying on the panel. Um, they have the responsibility. They are under the spotlight. Not everybody has just the, the personality or the desire or the... Uh, I would say the, the, the ability to actually be at the forefront, to be on the stage, to run foundations, to be a leader in the community. What you would expect for, from all of them, though, is that they would have just a personal conduct that, that was uh, respectful, that was uh, generous, that was uh, good people, good people. And what we tell our young uh, kids here, who hopefully one day will be champions in the sport, is that those are the values we want them to have. So we're just as happy when they go to a tournament and, and they win a championship, or they don't win, but the, we hear from the tournament, the, your, your, your boys were amazing, their behavior, how polite they were, how what their team spirit was. So if you get those early habits into the young aspiring champions, when they become the LeBron Jameses of the world and the, the big names and celebrities, they will also most likely have that kind of conduct. Uh, I'll give you a very quick couple of examples. We, we have the privilege of having um, one of the greatest football players of all time in, in Spain, Raul, uh, 16 years at Real Madrid, leading scoring in Champions League history, Real Madrid history. And, and it's not about him being here today and, and greeting everybody and just talking about foundation work. It's about the amount of time he's spent with our children, training with them, and, and setting the example of what a good professional on and off the pitch is. And that is the type of character that we're hoping to, to build for them for the future. I'm going to come to the students in just one second, but I, I just want to sort of counter that a little bit. Um, my youngest son loves football. He's a massive Liverpool fan. I know Casey, you look after Steven Gerrard. He loves Stevie G. Um, three footballers that he has massive respect for. Suarez, he wouldn't call a great role model. Zidane at Real Madrid, he let himself down on the biggest day of his life, a World Cup final. Um, and also, going back away, Eric Cantona. I mean, he kung fu kicked <laughs> a spectator as he was being sent off. And yet all of these, these people, are, they're still heroes, Casey. They, they can still be heroes, but that doesn't <laughs> mean they're role models. Um, and I think, uh, I think they were heroes to your son because of what they did on the pitch um, in a competitive setting, probably not because he aspired to be like them uh, in their conduct. And frankly, in this day and age, um, if, if more conduct was more exposed to more kids, I think uh, they'd be less likely to be role models and heroes. I think, you know, athletes are more prominent now than they ever have been. Um, you take the way LeBron handled uh, his going back to Cleveland and you look at how different that was to when he left Cleveland, there's no question. Part of that decision was because he understood very clearly now that he was a role model and needed to behave and conduct himself in a certain way. And he is now, to use your word, a hero to people all over the country and more importantly to his hometown in Northeast Ohio. Yeah, so there's a sophistication to this, isn't there, um, Ken? There's a sophistication to this, isn't there, Len, sorry? 
there's a sophistication to this from the young people who are watching between being a hero and being a role model. Well, the, the, uh, I think uh, we, we have to give our fans and yourselves a lot of credit out there in terms of the amount of intensity, the amount of avidity that you have for our product and for the, the players and athletes that we do have. The appetite for consumption of anything and everything associated with related to franchises, teams, players, has only gone to a whole exponential level. And again, this whole, the whole social media phenomenon has just exploded that beyond a, a, a level that I think was probably unfathomable as, as recently as five, six, seven years ago in terms of what we see now. And it's created a higher degree of accountability uh, because, again, there's, there's not many places you can't go uh, you know, relative to that. So I think that's uh, created a higher degree of accountability with the fan player, fan franchise relationship and, and uh, you know, right or wrong, a higher standard. Okay, let's hear from maybe four or five students now. Uh, put your hands up if you've got a view on this as to whether you view sportsmen and women as role models. Should they be? Shouldn't they be? Does it really matter? Do you care? Do you just want to see them doing great stuff on the field of play? So hands up. There's microphones going around. And t do tell us where you're from. Um, I'm Ishita from India. Um, I completely believe that role mod models are very important for any sport. I mean, for uh, women in particular, if there are role models, they'll be inspired to do better. And if there's media coverage, even better. So uh, I think a role model would be someone who uh, believes in his own self and uh, has self-motivation and someone who is able to win over the crowd. I mean, when we watch uh, someone like Michael Phelps, I know that I'm inspired by him to reach that level. So I think that's what a role model does. Michael Phelps is a very interesting example to give, uh, isn't it, Ivan? Because he's got some interesting behaviors. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I think to, to back, so I, I absolutely agree with, with, with the student who's, mm. who's bringing up this point. But to go back to the point of what kind of responsibility pressure they, they deal with, it, we also have to understand that they're young individuals who are going through the motions of life. And it takes uh, some time to get that maturity. And, and the LeBron of the first uh, era is a different LeBron now. So that needs to happen. Um, I think the role model needs to be that. And the role model also is, is not only for the athletes. The role model is for, for everybody who works at an organization. Because you know, when you think about the Cleveland Cavaliers and everybody thinks LeBron, but when, when Ken travels and people don't see LeBron, it is, uh, it is Len who they see and they say, hey, you are the Cavaliers. And, and he, he needs to also, with his actions, ex spread what that role model uh, or that behavior is. Same thing with Real Madrid. You go to China and it's, it's the crest. It's not a particular player. So in all of our actions, we also have to, that, uh, to do that. Another view from one of the students. Hi, my name is Eliana from United World College in Singapore. Um, I wouldn't use the term obligation, but I do think that role models should, uh, athletes should have a set of morals that they follow, regardless of whether they're athletes, but just as people, they need to act in a certain way that is respectful and even if especially being an athlete being in media for a lot of the time they can spread the good morals and values to everyone thank you Over there. thank you very much i'm glory cassie from nigeria <laughs> good voice uh, yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm looking forward to all the great athletes of the world, people like LeBron James, and one of my greatest models ever, Michael Jordan. As a little kid growing up, I only saw his picture just once, and that inspired me to play basketball. I watched this tape for once. I never looked back anymore. He has a charisma, uncanny instinct that when he, you, you just come out in the beauty and you just see this man playing, you just love to play basketball. I mean, not just basketball, all ramifications of sport, every part of sport. 
I mean, he's outgoing, he's loving, he's caring. He said, I love people. I love to be outgoing. That's the word of Michael Jordan. And I think he's a great, you know, great athlete that really inspired myself as a great player. And I'm coming up. I want to be like him someday. And I just know I'm going to meet him someday, you know. So you want to be like him as a basketball player or as a person as well? As a person. He has a great character. You know, if I can just add to that, yeah, I think that's a great, great statement. But uh, the thing about Michael, which has been very impressive, he's now ascended to the next dimension. He's actually an owner in, in our league and uh, been very successful. And so he's been a great role model, even to athletes, about how you can take your success and how do you transform that from an enterprise perspective. And, and now Michael is a very influential owner in the very league he was playing in. Okay, we've got a couple more. The, the young lady there, just in the center. Hello, my name is Estee Lomfemeyer. I'm from Amsterdam for the University of Applied Sciences. And I really agree with all the students we just heard, but shouldn't we also think about that athletes just do what they love and they kind of got like obligated to be a role model, like they didn't like not all of them choose to be a role model, and that, that's a lot to ask from someone, I think. I, it's, a, it's a very interesting point. I mean, they're, they're a good... Go ahead, Mark. Well, you raise a very good point. There are some athletes who embrace being a role model, and there are others who have that stature, that status thrust upon them. If I could just take one moment, I want to tell our audience about a heroic young athlete who's had being a role model thrust upon him. He's a young football player, American football player, who played for the New Orleans Saints. He blocked one of the most famous punts in football history after, in the first game after Hurricane Katrina in the Superdome. And when he retired two years ago, he was diagnosed with ALS, one of the worst diseases that we have in this world. And he has, over the last two years, as he's lost the use of every muscle in his body, he has become an overarching role model and a spokesperson and a symbol for that disease. And we have a, a, a 30 second clip, if we, if we could show it, um, that's a PSA that, that because he is such a role model, he was able to get several of his um, very, very famous teammates to make this PSA. And I'd like to show it to you to see, so you can see it, what a role model looks like when you have that thrust upon you. ALS doesn't just kill you, it shuts you down, little by little, bit by bit. It starts small. Maybe it's holding a pencil that gets difficult, or getting up from your chair. Then you find it hard to turn the pages of your book, because you can't move your fingers. Your mind keeps working, but your body doesn't respond. You won't see it coming, because no one knows where it comes from. Soon you can't hug your mother, or pick up your child. You won't be able to tie your shoes. You don't need to tie your shoes because now you can't walk. You can't eat or shave or laugh or sing. First you can't catch your ball, then you can't catch your breath. ALS doesn't just kill you. It steals your life a little bit at a time. And it doesn't stop until there's nothing left. Unless we stop it first. Unless we stop it now. I've seen Clayton. Let's pull our heads together and find a cure. I think one of the things that's coming out is it, it's not black and white, is it? There is room, if you like, for moral ambiguity that an athlete, a sportsman can be deeply flawed and yet have a massive impact. Casey? Yeah, no, no question. Um, you know... It, it's, it's the, uh, at, at that level of achievement or that level of success, there's no question that they can have an impact. Um, uh, you know, go back to Charles Barkley, I would argue he's still one of the most famous athletes in the world, and he couldn't have sort of um, thrown up in the face of being a role model more than anybody maybe ever. Um, he frankly built his fame on not being a role model, um, and yet he still had a big impact, and he still actually is... Uh, qu quite a leader in the sports industry and, 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 in, and in his community and it's 
it's, as you said, it's complicated and nuanced for sure. Indeed. Uh, and Mark, I mean, you've, so you've made a career out of getting people to give back celebrities, sportsmen and women. What do you find their motivation is? What do you, what do you tap into? Well, that's a, a very interesting question. It's a complicated one because there's so many motivations why people do good things. Um, very often it comes from the heart. In, in a case like Steve Gleason, it's coming from obvious need. Um, but as, as Casey will tell you, um, being philanthropic and giving back to the community is a very important part of your brand yeah. if you're an athlete. It enhances your marketability. It's a very important part of your brand. So it's both good for that, but it's also good for your soul and good for your heart. And I would never want to go in someone's heart or brain and examine it, but, uh, but I think there are many reasons why people do good and, and all of them contribute in a positive way. I mean, I can imagine you star in the Hollywood film, Casey, and the, the, the top athlete comes in and he says, set up a foundation, give a million, I'll get you 10 for it. No? <laughs> <laughs> if only it were that easy, you know? <laughs> if only it were that easy. But, you know, giving back is, a, is important. And I, I, you know, am a believer that, you know, it's our responsibility to give back. Mm. Um, and I think whether it's time or money uh, or leveraging their fame, um, athletes can have a tremendous impact in their ability to give back um, to their passions. I think it's important that they do it right, which is what you spend your life doing. Um, uh, but they have, a, they have a meaningful ability to move the needle. This is for you, uh, Len and Ivan, because you've worked with and working with teams. So you've got this brand, a franchise in your case, uh, Len, which obviously has great power to do good, and then you've got individuals which can, who can be wayward. How, how do you work with that, the, the code of conduct you require from people who play for your team? Well, well, first of all, I think we, we have a terrific owner in Dan Gilbert, who uh, Dan believes in great Midwestern cities that we have in our country. And uh, these, are, these are cities that aren't the major centers of population like in New York or LA, but great hardworking people and otherwise. And, and we believe that uh, it's a contact sport as far as civic engagement. And that's a big part of who we are as an organization uh, overall in working in concert with our community with Cleveland in investing in the city development. So Dan's invested over a billion dollars in downtown Cleveland, along with 12 companies, 4,000 team members working there, uh, all since his uh, inception and ownership of the franchise. And, and, and so that's, those are values that are important to us and we communicate that to our, our uh, team. And we do that through engagement uh, from a civic perspective and, and just our DNA in terms of who we are and how we how we communicate that and I think that was you know we well, I, can, If I can ask a question who's who has heard of Cleveland, Ohio out there if I can raise a Show of hands. I know it's not LA or New York and then who has heard of LeBron James? You know so because I, I, I even this has been great mm. to be at this Yvonne at this conference <laughs> I've, I've been amazed at first of all a number of people certainly you haven't Cleveland, Ohio being one but even with LeBron you know a number of you have and haven't heard but I think that's where our, our city was uh, excited about, uh, you know, LeBron is a native son of Northeast Ohio. And when you talk about values and how it emulates not just our, our franchise, but our market. And if I can call one, one slide here just to show. So he announced he was coming to Cleveland uh, through a online posting through Sports Illustrated, I'm coming home, which as that hit with the market, and I just want to pull out three quotes here and it just speaks to values. but. His relationship with the Northeast Ohio is bigger than basketball. Again, it's not just about games, it's about something bigger. Uh, that in Northeast Ohio, nothing is given, everything is earned. Speaking about our marketplace, we have to work for every single thing we get that's not handed to us. And then thirdly, I want, this is about realizing our kids, it's not about leaving Northeast Ohio, but this is a great place to grow up. And, and what was really powerful, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see this, I just want to show it here briefly, but he worked with uh, Nike in producing a segment here that spoke just to that, to our city, and uh, wrapping our franchise into it that was incredibly powerful. I get goosebumps about it, but just want to show you that here briefly as well. We're going to bring it on in. It's time now. It's our city. We got to do it for them, dog. We got to do it for Cleveland. They're waiting on us.
every single night, every single practice, every single game. We got to give it all we got. Because they're going to ride with us. Everything that we do on this floor, because of this city, we owe them. We're going to grind for this city. They're going to support us, man, but we got to give it all back to them. We get it done. The toughness that we have on the court is going to come from this city. Everybody, the whole city of Cleveland, that's what it's all about. It's time to bring them something special. Let's go. Bring it on in, everybody. Let's go. Let's go. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Together. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Together. Here we go, man. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Together. Right here. Let's get it. It's all us. Click it on three. One, two, three. So, so anyways, that sort of says it in a nutshell. But you know, ultimately, that's what I think we all aspire for. You don't need a team talk, do you? You just play that before the start of each game. <laughs> and I think, you know, I mean, fans will probably forgive a player anything except not playing for the badge. I think so. <laughs> I think, I think, yeah. This is the perfect example. For us, you know, the, the difference is we have an advantage, which is we, we're working with young athletes now who, who still don't think they are bigger than the organization or the, the institution we're trying to build with them and through them. Uh, but, but ultimately, there's nothing like a connection to, to your roots and to where you play for. This happens uh, in Qatar when, uh, you know, we have in the audience right now, and I'm very happy to see him here, our, our bronze medalist in the high jump at the London Olympics and, and one of the hopeful and one of the great stars, uh, Mutaz Abashim. And he's here because, because he feels connected to this place. And when he wins and where he competes, the whole country is behind him. And that happens with LeBron when he's in Cleveland because he's one of their own. Or it happens at Real Madrid or Chelsea where, where a home product or a homegrown player comes out through the system. They understand they play a role within that co uh, community. I, I would say last because I know we're going to wrap it up soon. So again, with, with not everybody being of the statue of, of LeBron or Michael Jordan, uh, th is the little gestures that each and every one of those athletes can do. When we go to Senegal with Messi uh, and we went last year and a kid has come walking two days to be able to see Messi, all he needs is a little smile from Messi. That's all he needs. He doesn't need him to run a foundation, give back millions to uh, Africa projects. He just needs that smile. And that is, I think, that is a must for these guys. What it really comes down to is being a celebrated athlete in today's world brings you wealth and fame, but being a role model brings you immortality. Two of the greatest athletes of all time in terms of role models are two tennis players, Arthur Ashe and Andre Agassi. And I would argue that they're greater in their roles as role models than they even were as athletes. As great an athlete as each man was, Arthur Ashe has an immortal role in race relations throughout the world. And Andre Agassi is talked about more now as a philanthropist no than he even was as a tennis player. Yeah, and Agassi, and Muhammad Ali is the third. Yeah. And of course, when he, he, he came over to England and we had to make him wear white at Wimbledon, he was like the bad boy. And yeah, it's amazing. Uh, let's, we've got well, about a minute left. I'd just like to hear from a couple of the students again, just comments, observations, just very quickly. Just. Hi, everybody. Um, Hugo from PSL in France. Um, so I just wanted to say that it's. Um, I totally agree with what the last student said, and it's, um, I wanted to add that when an, an athlete um, stands up for not a, uh, a good cause, like poverty or something like, like this, but for a political cause, most of the time he is like, criticized and people just say that he doesn't have to do this. So. Yeah, politics is a whole 
interesting thing again. I don't think we can even start <laughs> on political <laughs> intervention by athletes, but it is a very good point. Um, and time. one more, just another, yeah, another time, another panel for next year, Richard. And it's the gentleman over there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matthew Lickie. Got uh, the University of Regina from Canada with me, and I agree that I think athletes are, in a way, obligated to be role models. But I also think that it's important that we don't over glorify them and realize that they're still humans and that they will make mistakes and that that's okay. I mean, no one wants to see it happen, but it does happen. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you very much. And of course, the reality is we can all make a difference, can't we? Whether in a, a little way or a big way. A huge thank you to the panel. You've been fantastic. Please, one more time.